right here to my right is Vicky Acevedo, known to many of you in the audience. Um, she is a, I'm going to read her official biography because it's so impressive. She is a senior legal counsel consultant on transactional mediation and social entrepreneur with a long-standing interest in sustainable development. And I think what a lot of people know her for these days is that she founded the Green Market in Santa Cruz, which has been a really important initiative um, for local farmers, um, producers, people interested in turning our economy around. Um, she will introduce the other speakers, but before we hear from them, uh, because this is, after all, a literature festival, we thought that we should begin this morning with some literature, with a poem. And because the whole question of you know, the future for all of us is really a question for people younger than any of us on stage to answer, we thought we'd start with a young poet. So I would like you in a moment to welcome Danica Thomas, um, who is well known as one of our best young spoken word poets with a uh, particular is uh, interest in some very serious social issues around gender, around the environment, um, she's going to give us what we're calling a wake-up poem this morning. So if anyone hasn't had enough coffee, this performance is going to wake you up and get you ready to listen to this conversation. Um, and as always, we, uh, there'll be time for all of you in the audience to ask questions, to join the conversation. So you know, make notes of all the wonderful ideas and provocations that come into your heads so that you can join the conversation a bit later on. Uh, but first, to get, get things started, let's give Danica a big hand, round of applause to welcome her and all the other panelists. Hi, good morning, everyone. So the name of this piece is called Magicians. Once upon a time, there were these magicians. I was told that on the sixth day of creation, they were made from dust, given the earth as a gift for existing and told to go forth and make magic. Can you imagine being given an entire planet they were supposed to make it a better place, supposed to maintain and enhance its beauty, bring smiles to a crowd of seven billion faces, live in harmony with all of the organisms that existed in that space. And I guess they did for some time. But my mother had a line, she said all the time, she said, all good things started hot and sweaty, but people never followed through. And according to this story, it must be true. See, these magicians, humbled, curious, innocent, started simple. So they moved from traveling on the backs of donkeys to soaring heaven in their flying machines in their hands. The world would become smaller. They would light up the night sky with artificial stars in the absence of the sun, cure the sick with science, walk on the moon in suits made of breaths. And in the same breath, they would leach the land of her lustre, turn oceans into acid, transfuse every last bit of her blood into their vehicles, exhaust the sky with their exhaust, and if, as if that isn't enough, they will leak all the moisture from her eyes so that the king tides brimming behind her eyelids come out in the form of deserts, and when they're finished, they will sit on their thrones and watch as the world crumbled into nothing. Can you imagine having all that power and being nothing but parasite, having the world try to shake itself free of you, having the force feed itself to fields having hurricanes hurry themselves into the stomachs of the thirsty having the sea submerge cities in warm hugs how long do you think a drowning village can hold its breath for see these magicians can turn cool icelands into burning infernos isn't it magical how by the year 2050, some islands like Trinidad and Tobago will cease to exist, isn't it magical? How their greatest disappearing act will be how they will make entire islands go extinct, isn't it magical? How the actions of these magicians can demolish an entire planet, and they'll do it for profit. And because of them, one day we'll all have to flee our homes like wildlife running out of a burning forest. And when the last tree is cut, when the last river is polluted, when the last bit of fresh air is respired, when we've used up everything and made the land ugly and uninhabitable, maybe then those magicians would use their magic to reverse the damage that they've done. Or maybe it will be too late. Or maybe we will all live happily ever after. Thank you.
And everyone, in case you don't already know this, if you want some more of that kind of amazing stuff, the uh, National Poetry Slam finals are on on Sunday night. It's the grand finale of the festival. Um, and this is exactly the kind of power that you get there. So uh, Danica ended with the idea of you know, um, happy endings, I think. Um, our happy ending, or actually happy beginning, is that having, I just told you that, um, that Mark Loqua, an NGC president, was not able to join us, and he's miraculously appeared at the back of the room. <laughs> so he can join us, so give that a round of applause. <laughs> and what we're gonna have to do is we just need to reconfigure the stage slightly so we can fit on it, so you give us a, mo a moment, and we'll get things started. So let me, right, okay, let me go. Excited to uh, have all these wonderful people up here. Mark, thanks for making it in. That's great. He can. He will help me with my pun about creative energy. Uh, so you know, Mark Loquan is the head, president, CEO, National Gas Company of Trinidad. Would I'm sorry. Yes, CEO. Yes. Okay. Let me get it correct. I was going to get everybody to introduce themselves, but I. President, National Gas Company of Trinidad and Tobago, all the same, and a very generous supporter of this very important festival for many years. And so for that, he deserves a great deal of praise, as does the company, very forward thinking. Alexander Gervan is next to him, and Alexander is an environmental economist. He is currently working with the ACS, Association of Caribbean States, Next to him, Sharifa Ali, who is the Assistant Resident Representative of the United Nations Development Program, UNDP, and um, a socio-economist. Now, that's as opposed to a political economist. You know, we have a lot of new fields these days that merge disciplines. And very pleased to be sitting next to Philip Nanton, whose book, uh, Frontiers of the Caribbean, is a real inspiration for this panel. Um, he uh, takes many disciplines and has put them together. He's a writer and a sociologist and uh, has given us a new way of thinking about global change. So it's very exciting to have all these people here. I'm gonna be moderating this panel. We're going to try to have a conversation as opposed to a state of uh, lectures and comments towards you. And I'm gonna start out by asking each one to tell me one word or a string of words, I will not be so rigid, that when I say Caribbean island state of mind, Caribbean islands, what do you think of, Mark? I guess I get to go first for coming late. <laughs> uh, 
So I think of talent. Uh, and the reason why I, why I think of that is that even though we come from a very tiny island, uh, from my energy perspective, uh, you know, I get to meet, fortunately, a lot of people around the world. Uh, in our global um, outreach in Africa and in many other places regionally. And there's always a Trinidadian or some Caribbean person um, that has, you know, they're in senior positions, they're in highly technical, specialized positions, and they're all over the world in some of the top facilities um, that, I've, that I've seen and I've met, right? Uh, e even in Angola, uh, where That's they right. had a brand new LNG plant built there, they were, the people who were training the people were people from Atlantic LNG, Trinidadians. So from a, from a global standpoint, I see that. From the world of pan um, and music and so on, which I've been involved with for many years, uh, I also meet a lot of people in steel band across all over the world. And here's our instrument that has been widely accepted uh, across the globe outside of Trinidad. So even though we, we, we come from a small island, here it is that we're having so much impact outside. So talent it comes to mind. Very good, very interesting. Alexander. To be very honest, I'm going to parallel what you said, and in this regard, going first is an advantage. Um, <laughs> uh, my word would be disproportionate, um, and, and it, it echoes what you're saying. You know, we're six million people in the islands, um, which is really a, a tiny fraction of the global population, but our impact in the world's metropoles um, is really quite significant. Um, the biggest festival in London, is Caribbean inspired, Notting Hill. The language of Toronto is influenced by Jamaica and the Caribbean. Um, if you look at New York, it's, its fabric is influenced by Caribbean people. So really and truly, when you consider that we're only six million people in the world, but if you were to go to these metropoles, they would struggle to describe um, the features of a country like uh, Indonesia or Pakistan, which is a population of well over 100 million people. It's, it's quite spectacular what our impact is on a global scale, so my word would be disproportionate. Disproportionate impact, I would add. Disproportionate impact. Yes, Sharifa. So my word is possibilities, and I heard the chairperson earlier talking about possibilities, limitless, limitless possibilities. And I'm inspired by this after a conversation with my 16-year-old daughter who told me, Mom, I'm having an existentialist crisis. Said, what? <laughs> Don't you young people have boyfriend crises or crises about hair or... No, mom, most of the girls in my class are having an existentialist crisis. There's so much cynicism amongst our young people. When I was hearing about the magicians just now, I was like, okay, doomsday. And, and there is need for us to really look at an island state of mind with optimism, with renewed energy and creative energy to be able to tap the potential of our young people, of all our peoples, to be able to really realize the potential of these island states. Beautiful, unspoiled, idyllic islands amidst the blue Caribbean Sea. And I'm dressed for it. <laughs> An outfit I actually bought at the green market from one of our local entrepreneurs. And I think this really represents for us what we can do as a region, as the Caribbean. So I see limitless possibilities, even amidst the environmental crises, even amidst you know, the, the adaptation that we have to make for climate change. I see that we can, we, can, we can succeed, that there is potential. So limitless possibilities. Philip. Okay, but well, there always has to be one person to bring the whole show down. <laughs> it always happens, and unfortunately, I think it's me. My word is hustling, and it seems to me that the Caribbean is essentially a place of hustling. It's hustling at three levels. There's the individual hustling, there's the business hustling, and there's the government or the state hustling and I'm happy to talk about any of them. But let me start with one example of the earliest kind of hustling at the individual level, which goes back um, to a story some of you who are old as, as old as me would know. Uh, <clears throat> it's a sort of a rum shop kind of story. 
the, um, James Brown was supposed to be coming to play a fet, uh, a big fet, and so the tickets were selling out like hotcakes. James Brown is coming on Saturday. James Brown is coming. We're selling tickets, selling tickets. Of course, Saturday comes and no James Brown. People say, oh, well, that ain't smart. The smartness thing is you're doing it the next month, and then James Brown still ain't coming. That is what I'm talking about. And that is one example of the early kind of individual hustling. OK. So now we have four words up here. I want the audience to think about their word, because when we get to the question and answer and comment part of this, uh, we would like to hear some more words that uh, describe our island state of mind. Uh, the comments clearly show that what we see depends mainly on what we look for. So if you have a certain state of mind and you're looking for certain things, those are the things that you start to see. I would like to say that my word was really diversity and multiculturalism. And for me, that is what the Caribbean truly represents. And uh, I got a little map of the Caribbean, and it was very exciting. We think about the Caribbean islands, but we really don't think about northern South America. We don't think about the Yucatan. We don't think about Florida and Louisiana. So there's a huge Caribbean, and um, I want to get the panel really started with this quote uh, from Philip's book. This extensive migration requires nothing less than a reconceptualization of the role of the state. He notes that the practices of Caribbean peoples are at great variance from the exclusive claim for a singular loyalty to the state. Can you all hear me over the siren? Caribbean peoples share a common deterritorialized imaginary. This requires a reconceptualization of the notion of sovereignty. And I think this is so interesting because a state of mind is about your imagination. And if your imagination is not tied to a geographical area, you can be a Caribbean person in Toronto. You can be a West Indian person in Brooklyn. You can be a black British person in London or Brixton. You know, you can be all of those things. And so what does it mean that we don't really hearken to our territory as a reason for how we imagine ourselves? I open it up to all of you. Pick your word. Um, you said something interesting about, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but you said something interesting about Caribbean-ness being more than just the islands. This is about the islands, but sometimes I think in the islands we forget that 115 million people live around the Caribbean Sea. And when you interact with Caribbean people from Central America, from Northern South America, um, from, from the Gulf, you realize that they feel very connected to us, but sometimes we forget about them. Um, when you go to Nicaragua, if you go to Colombia, you hear people speaking, you go to Panama, some of them are speaking with Jamaican accents, some of them are speaking with Vincentian accents. And I think, you know, the idea of this statelessness, this floating Caribbeanness, needs to be embraced because as we, as we really begin to understand that, we begin to understand the richness of what we have and the, the vastness of our assets. And I think that that's something maybe to speak about. The, the, the vastness of our assets and the fact that our assets go well beyond the oil, the, the, you know, the, the mining, the, the physical assets. This mm -hmm. cultural Caribbean Mark identity Stalin. is invaluable. So that's interesting to me, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a conversation, you know, don't make it too stiff. I, I tend to think about the Caribbean as, um, yes, there certainly is that element of uh, that, that international aspect of it, um, if you like, the diaspora element. And I think, um, for me, the, one of the key features of the Caribbean, if you like, is a, is a constant, there's like a kind of a dance that goes on between the kind of creolization that we have in the Caribbean, each Caribbean island, 
and the hunting for that diasporic link, whether it is back to India or to Africa um, or to Europe or to China. Um, and we are constantly, I think, moving in that relationship between those two, th those two issues, our, the creolized world that we have created in the Caribbean through the coming together of the range and diversity of whether it's through forced migration or chosen migration, um, and the things that have been come out of that. The newness is the creolization, I would say. But at the same time, um, there is also a very strong sense of the diasporic link uh, to individual at other parts of the world. And I think that um, for me, uh, if you like, the islandness uh, is involved in that constant, sometimes it's a battle and sometimes it's a dance between those two ideas. Interesting. Sharifa, you were going to say? Yes, I was just going to say, it's, it's striking how very similar we are while we're diverse in the Caribbean. <laughs> like and, and, you know, the diversity extends across, you know, ethnicity, uh, you know, language, you know, the works. But when we examine, our, examine the issues and we're talking about Caribbean states of mind and how do we realize the potential, we have very similar issues. And we need to leverage our talent that Mark spoke about to be able to address some of these issues in a way that allows us to realize the potential of a region. Mm -hmm. So I guess my, my thoughts lie along the line of paradox. And we have such a rich uh, cultural diversity. Uh, you see that our own identity, for lack of a better word, is celebrated outside. Yes. So people create, you know, I've been to Australia and there are these huge steel band festivals and carnival and goat racing. <laughs> and I say, you know, I'm seeing this in Australia. I never saw good recent in Tobago, but here I am seeing it in, in Australia. Um, and at the same time, you know, I'm seeing Japanese embracing the, the, the you know, so many steel bands in, in, in Japan playing like crack shots. Um, but I look back in Trinidad and I see that the appreciation that I see outside. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, this, this, ability to transform this potential that we have is, is limited. Um, and why are we limited? Are we limited by our imagination? Because I, I, I heard the quote talking about you know, reimagining uh, just outside of this small island state of mind. Um, and, I, and I think it does call for a, a recognition of, of how we uh, create our own identities. You know, it, it has to be more than learning maths and English in school, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because I think it has to do with, with how we actually embed our own culture and identity from small. Uh, and, and I think that, that that piece is missing, but even not, notwithstanding that, and people leave and they go away, and they're away for many years, um, they're creating, you know, this identity that, that they miss. Um, so I, I think of paradox. So I think that is a, from a global can perspective. I, can I take up that point? The same mm. point you were making about um, you know, the, that, that process in, in Australia and so on. Uh, in Karikou, to turn the thing around, what you have is the, is the, um, the Shakespeare mass in which Shakespeare <laughs> is used um, by teams competing to be able to recite um, recite me the speech of, of so-and-so, is, is one uh, is, is, is said. And then, you know, if you can't say this speech completely, you basically you get licks, which is, again, which is a very traditional Caribbean thing. There's a lot of licks in the Caribbean. And, and so you have, so, so it's actually, it's moving both ways. That, that, that's what I would like to add. I really like what you said, and, and it's unusual that it sometimes takes people the third person perspective to recognize the gold mine we're standing on. You know, we're standing on a gold mine and it takes the diaspora, it takes somebody who is a second generation Trinidadian away to recognize the real richness and value of what we have here. It takes almost a foreigner sometimes to recognize the, the pricelessness of, 
of, of our culture and our assets. And it is an issue of pride. It is an issue of how these things are taught and embedded in people from a young age. And we almost, mm -hmm. you know, we're standing on this rock and it's almost like we can't even see. We're always looking, we're always looking out. And it's, it's kind of sad and it, it does limit the possibilities. And, and you definitely see it in, in certain things like carnival. You know, when, when, we, when we present the tourism product, it's what we think people want to see. But when they come, they don't necessarily want to go to only all-inclusive fets. They want to maybe go see a stick fighting in South. Mm -hmm. you know, they maybe want to go see a, a Blue Devils in Paramin. But even, even our, own, our own people, you know, maybe Trinidad and they've never been to Paramin to see um, Blue Devils. Exactly. It's, it's crazy. And it has to do with how we embed that pride and recognize that gold. But it's part of being on a tiny island. You know, you can't look down and say, oh, I'm on a rock. You're just always looking out at the sea, at the boats passing, and the islands in the distance. So uh, I think that that issue of embedding pride from a young age is something we need to address. Yeah, there's a, a, a validation point that's being made, and I hope all of you are hearing it, when Sharifa said, while we diverse, I love this because she's made what was an adjective into a verb, you know, while we diverse, like how children are now saying how we adult. You know, so while we diverse is, is very interesting. And then, of course, the original globalization is the paradox because everybody came here 600 years ago, everybody. And there was an encounter of all the other people who weren't coming in. So there has consistently been an effort to find out where one came from and who one is. So that is uh, what I'm hearing in this conversation right now. Um, Sharifa. I was just going to add confidence, and, and Mark, you spoke about, and my other panelists spoke about, you know, people appreciating us after they leave or after several generations. And how do we instill that confidence in ourselves? We belong to a culture where we promote cynicism, sensationalism, where we are crabs in a barrel almost. We pull down, we, we get pleasure in pulling down people, in looking for the negative, in not celebrating positive as much as we should, in, in not celebrating the successes. The very young people you spoke about, and, 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 and you know, you're saying, well, we teach them maths and English. I'm not even sure we teach them that, because if you look at the results of maths and English, it's appalling. I taught for a number of years, and then I ran from the classroom, um, and I ran somewhere else, and you keep, you know, probably running around, you know, trying to just find a way you could add value. But we need to teach our children, and we need to inspire and nurture that confidence in us as citizens of this, you know, country, as citizens of this region, as citizens of the world, and really to help them to take their place. When we look at, at, at the intelligence, the wisdom that our children you know, um, display, second to none, we have global leaders. And yet, we do not see, we do not, we do not you know, um, celebrate these, these, these leaders. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you talked about talent as well. When we look at the scholarships, when we look at how we nurture you know, these innate abilities, are we really looking at nurturing these children and, and promoting the culture, promoting the areas of diversification? I think somebody mentioned diversification. Are we really looking at our economy in the next 20, 30, 50 years? Mm -hmm. Or are we still based on the traditional areas? Yeah. My same 16 year old wants to be a fashion designer. And my husband was saying, well, you're gonna live long enough to mine, huh? I said, no. What kind of old thinking is that? Certainly, that's something that we want to celebrate. And then she's doing a project about it, and I'm like scratching my head, you know, <laughs> where's the post support? The challenges that artists, you know, um, you know face. Mm -hmm. How do we really, you know, engage these children? And, and we've seen the kind of success and the talent that our country has in creativity and innovation. And how do we nurture these things? We've seen it in energy, we've seen it in the environment, we've seen it in the arts. So I think it's really about that confidence and supporting and nurturing our young people so that they can unleash their potential. Can I yeah. come in on the, the yes. issue of celebrating um, the hero as well? And, the, and uh, specifically, 
uh, try to link it to the literature festival as well, mm -hmm. in the sense that, and I also want to link it to um, to my hustling. So I'm coming back to the hustling, <laughs> okay. um, and I want to uh, think about <clears throat> Homer's um, Iliad and Homer's Odyssey, because it seems to me that um, there is a very interesting uh, op choice Homer gives us, and a way of reading those those two pieces of literature. Um, in a sense, we are caught between two possible directions. One is to be the upstanding kind of Ach Achilles kind of person, the upstanding hero, the hero who is always going to, to do the right thing, if you like, um, and avenge his friend's death uh, and, and all the rest of it. And on the other hand, of course, you also have Odysseus. And Odysseus is, of course, the smart man. Odysseus is the one who is going to find a way to get through and getting through. And I raise this in terms of literature and heroes because when I was thinking about, if you think about, for example, uh, Derek Walcott's writing, when Derek Walcott started off his writing uh, as in terms of islands, it was very much for a while about the individual on the beach. Um, the eye mm -hmm. um, identifies the sail, a sail going out, a sail coming in. Um, but after a while, it became increasingly obvious that his interest, he doesn't write very much about Achilles. He writes a lot about Odysseus. Oh, and it seems to me that the interest for the, uh, for the artist is not necessarily, you have to have the upstanding person, of course, but <laughs> very often they're so boring. <laughs> uh, it's, the, it's the devious and the person who finds a way of getting through is far more interesting and for me far more exciting. Well, it's interesting. I, I really want to get to Sharifa's point about what do we do and look a little bit at the issues challenging us, but then the protagonist that we are, which is what Philip is talking about, who are we? I wouldn't use devious. Why, why don't we use creative? I mean, <laughs> don't have to be devious uh, in order to get through, but you do have to be creative. And I think that as we uh, look, because I know that this panel is supposed to look a little bit at our place in the global economy, and so, who are we as Caribbean people as protagonists in this global economy? I mean, I'm reading the four right now, so I throw it out, Google, Amazon, Apple, and uh, Facebook. And I mean, I'm frightened by the market capitalization of these companies, by the technical skill that they have, by the fact that they're moving from being a platform to being shipping companies and supermarkets, and they're just, you know, it's like the tentacles are moving out. And where is this larger Caribbean in that movement? You know, we need energy to supply these machines so far, but I don't know if that will be forever, so. Where are we, where do we go? So maybe I'll <clears throat> take the energy perspective now. Good. Um, <laughs> because we, we find ourselves at a very precarious point. And there's no doubt that we have to be creative. Um, if we think about being sustainable for the future, uh, we now are at the point where, you know, five years ago, the, the total oil revenue as a percentage of the total revenue was, you know, 33%. In 2017, it was 1.7%. So that's quite a substantial difference to our economy, which is largely dependent on oil and gas, you know, whether we like it or not at this point in time. <clears throat> the gas situation, as you would know, we've had a shortage of gas for, you know, the last seven, eight years. Um, that largely has been due to investment that has not happened in time as things deplete. So obviously you find yourself at a point where, you know, you have all these great assets that takes a very long time to, to replicate. A point leases industry um, where you now find yourself as a tiny little island being, you know, the top exporters of ammonia and methanol. Uh, some of those plants, you know, are at reduced rates, or some of them are shut down. 
Um, and here we are trying to find solutions um, that will solve this issue. Of course, these solutions are not solved overnight. Uh, and that's why you see Trinidad now trying to think outside of Trinidad. Yes, we have to produce uh, a lot of these shallow water fields are already under production. So where is your creativity going to come in? You know, you have to now look at smaller fields that have been left apart. You know, we call it marginal fields here. And if we don't go after it, then we continue to be in shortfall. Or you have to look across the border, like Venezuela, like Grenada, which, which um, you know, uh, if we don't do it, then really where we, where we place ourselves is have all these competitive assets that are, you know, some of the most modern in the world, the LNG assets are some of the most capital efficient assets that exist anywhere in the world, right? The plants that are being built in LNG today to fill the future supply of energy are so much more expensive. Mm -hmm. But we sit here underutilized. So there's no doubt in the energy world you see us trying to be creative. Okay. Now the paradox of, of it all is why we continue to try to find sustainable solutions to our energy issues. The world is changing, the world is going on, right? The US has now become a you know, an exporter of gas, who would have thought that? You know, they've been importing our LNG for, for years, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and, and what has been happening now, Africa, like Mozambique, Ghana, Tanzania, I mean, they have large gas fines. Um, they want to build LNG. They want to build up on leases. Uh, they are now coming to Trinidad. In fact, Ghana is here now. Right. Um, so they're now coming to Trinidad to say, well, you know, you guys have done this for decades, you know, let us learn from you. So in a way, the world has become a, a, a place where we have to depend on each other. It's become a much smaller place. Yes. Uh, and we really need to find, in terms of molecules anyway, uh, an and intellectual property to, um, to really uh, start new industries. Uh, we do have to think differently. We do have to think beyond the borders and jurisdictions of Trinidad and Sovereignty. Tobago. So that's the energy story, right? I could talk about the culture side, but I, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah. Um, the word you mentioned the most uh, was assets. And I think um, coming from an economic perspective, that's looking into the future, that's quite important. And I would challenge people here today to go on the street, and ask five people, you know, what are the Caribbean's most valuable assets? What is Trinidad's most valuable assets? And most people would be quick to say oil and gas, LNG, maybe manufacturing, things like that. Most people wouldn't say carnival. Most people wouldn't say culture. Mm -hmm. And you know, what you just said from an economic perspective, from a financial perspective, is that oil is no longer a natural gas is no longer a real true comparative advantage. You know, because of shale, you can have a, a, a shale fuel up in six weeks and the price is going to stabilize for gas. You know, you have Mozambique, as you said, emerging. So really and truly, we have to ask ourselves, what is our comparative advantage? That's a really important idea in economics. What differentiates you from everyone else? And there's a reason we're coming back to culture. There's a reason you mentioned Japanese people playing pan. There's a reason that whenever people want to have fun and want to be happy, they think about Caribbean things. They think about festival, they think about carnival, they think about the beach, they think about dance, they think about our music. And it is overdue for us to recognize those as our future. And if we don't begin to think about how we can commercialize those while respecting what they are, then we're not really taking advantage of what differentiates us, what makes us different. And we have to do that going into the future because, simply because of globalization, what differentiates us? And what's the difference between extractive and generative? Because extractive is non-renewable and generative like carnival and festivals and beach is at least so far renewable if we don't fill it with plastic in the next <laughs> 10 years. But. <laughs> Yeah, I think the point's valid. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that our oceans are not filled with plastics yet. Um, I know we've been talking about beverage container bills and, <laughs> and so forth. So I wanted to talk about the blue economy 
and leveraging the Blue Sea, the Caribbean Sea. If we look at successful countries like Chile and so forth, um, they have been able to leverage the oceans around them, but not by overfishing, and, and, but doing it in a very sustainable way. And they have been able to do something that we've struggled with, um, the hustling culture, uh, you know, where we, uh, we have not been able to connect the research institutions with development, with marketing, whether it's tourism, whether it's agriculture, whether it's, you know, industry. So if we are to look at the blue economy and we are to connect the dots to get the research institutions, the careers and so forth, the, the CARDIs, the international organizations, and to be able to help us to develop some of these industries, and then to have world-class products that we can sell and market these things. We have Export TT, we have a number of government agencies as well. And I think it's important for us to look at that, but to do it in a sustainable fashion. We know with climate change and global warming, our reefs, which, which would really have, you know, I think most of the, um, the fishes live in, 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 in reefs. And we need to also ensure that that's, those are protected because they are a valuable source of livelihoods, you know, of, of entertainment. Um, and, and we need to do it in a sustainable manner. So while we talk about oil and gas, and yes, we're blessed that we've had oil and gas, we also have to look at doing that in the most efficient way so that our reduction of fossil fuels, we've signed on to Paris, um, we've ratified the Paris Agreement, which means that we must cut greenhouse gas emissions by 15% in industry and transport and, and the energy sector by 2030. How are we going to do that? What's the plan to do that? while still growing the economy. And it's, it's really painful um, in terms of the investment in, in Point Lisas. I grew up in the Ministry of Finance and that's in Haiti with methanol and all the ammonia plants and so on, and to see what has happened. And then even our relationship with Venezuela right now to be able to get you know, the, the raw material to be able to, to refine. So I think we need to really look at a plan that help us, helps us to move our economy um, you know, and to be more proactive and progressive rather than reactive because we're just a speck really and, and you know, as economists say, we are price takers. We are vulnerable, very vulnerable to the shocks. Um, shocks, oil price shocks, commodity prices, and we haven't started talking about the hurricanes and the catastrophic hurricanes and one of the words that I was toying with was, was resilience yeah. and we can talk about that further. Can I just also pick up, um, I was just sort of thinking about in terms of the, the shape of this panel um, and the talk about, I'm going to say shape, I mean, I'll talk about, I'll see what I mean by that in a minute. I mean, basically I mean, I am the small islander here. That's what I mean. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm thinking about the Eastern Caribbean and I'm thinking about Barbados. And so we don't have those tremendous resources. Uh, we have, yeah, well, not when they come down to Trinidad, <laughs> but, but the, the, the thing is, though, that um, so we have also have to find a way to survive and, and, and find a way of getting through. And one of the ways that has been found, of course, is um, what is euphemistically called the financial service industry. Well, if that isn't hustling, I don't know what is. But, <laughs> but, and the financial service industry is actually the second most important industry, for example, in Barbados. Don't mention um, Turks and Caicos and other places in terms of the serious money that is, that is there. And basically what we're talking about is places for people to hide their money. That is basically what we're talking about. And that is what we're providing. Uh, and we've been doing that for a long time. I think in terms of banking, the Caribbean is about the fourth largest banking area in the world. Now, that is a serious, a serious issue. Uh, and this is, and well, that has arisen because basically because of smartness. You know, you say, well, we are providing an opportunity for people to hide their money. Bring it and we'll hide it for you. That is basically what we've been doing. Uh, I mean, I'm not saying there's anything good. I'm not making a value judgment about that. I'm saying that's what's been happening. Uh, a lot, there, obviously, then you can make the value judgments that you want. But then what is happening is that also, um, of course, other people say, well, you know, uh, the big problem in the Caribbean is not that that is happening, is that it's not regulated. I mean, that is, that is, the, that is what has been thrown out at us. Uh, the OECD throw that, throw that at us all the time. 
and so more and more regulations are invented. And so what do we do, you know, um, having discovered that, is there another area that we can go into? Well, the answer is yes. Uh, and that, that there is this new area, and this new area is selling passports. <laughs> That's <laughs> what we do. So now what we do is we say, well, you know, imagine a, a little uh, country called St. Saint, Saint Kitts and Nevis. St. Kitts and Nevis has about 53, 54,000 people. St. Kitts and Nevis have been selling passports since 1980-something. Mm -hmm. And in the recent years, they have been so successful that they have turned the economy around of St. Kitts and Nevis. It is now, I think, the second most valuable economy in the Caribbean at the moment after the Bahamas. Now, that is a serious turnaround. And, um, and now, if you, if you imagine, and I think they have, uh, one figure I saw was, I, they don't sort of issue these officially, but my understanding is about 2,000 passports a, a, a year are sold. Now imagine you have a country of 52, 53,000 people. You're selling 2,000 new citizens every, every year. Soon, who is going to be your citizen? And, and, you know, and the citizens are not located in St. Kitts. You can, you can, if you like, I think order. I have to buy property. Oh yes, of course. You you buy prop. <laughs> yes, the, 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 there are two con that. two conditions. <laughs> One, uh, yeah. Uh, well, it varies because it it used to be two hundred, uh, but uh, and uh, so so you have that, and then you can either buy property or you can give make a donation to the government. Um, uh, and uh, one or the other. Uh, and no, the, the, no, but the interesting thing is what we do in the Caribbean as well is. So St. Kitts has been doing this. Yes, what a great idea. Why don't we in Grenada do that? And then also, why don't, uh, why don't uh, Antigua and Barbuda do that, which they are now doing? And then the most recent one that's joined the, joined the game is, is St. Lucia. Oh, Dominica has been doing it for a while now, yes. Uh, Dominica also allows you to vote. <laughs> so, so, you have, so you have an interesting thing where um, reverse the, colonial, the whole concept... Reverse colonialism. Well, the whole, <laughs> the whole concept of citizenship, that upstanding yes. thing that you belong to, that you salute the flag, you know, that the, the, the place that you're supposed to die for, well, these folks aren't going to die for you. Well, we don't know that yet, Philip, but I, I, we don't really know that yet. They might get very happy and they might start to love their adopted country. But I, I really want to pick up on uh, Philip's point about the money and uh, the financial services because we have global companies. And this is, it's not so much about hiding the money, it's about taking advantage of the different rules in different countries. And all of, you know, in Trinidad, you raise the other very important point that this panel needs to keep not focusing on Trinidad, but think about the wider Caribbean. It is very important. I see Alexander I think, wants to um, say. I think Philip is stirring the pot. I, I think he's stirring the pot. And I have to, I really have to challenge what you're saying. Um, you you know, we, we, as, we as a Caribbean, we started off very collectivist. And over time, with the influence of, of North America, we've become more about the individual, right? Um, you see that hustling thing on a micro scale, when I'm in Jamaica, when I'm in Trinidad, when I go to the market, when I walk on the street and I see how people dress themselves, how people differentiate themselves, it's beautiful. It's spectacular. But in terms of our leadership, that, in my opinion, is what has brought us down. Our, our 50 years ago, when we, when we had independence, 60 years ago almost, um, we were ahead of Singapore. Our leaders were strong, and our leaders, while flawed, were thinking about, by and large, their legacy. They were thinking about how they'd be, re be remembered. And over time, especially with North American influence, it's about the individual. It's about the smart man, particularly in Trinidad. And I have seen, as I have moved here, and I really shouldn't be doing this because I'm in diplomacy, I shouldn't be talking about Jamaica and Trinidad, <laughs> but I'm going to wait into some water right here. As, um, as I moved to Trinidad, I've seen the smart man being the man praised. I've seen people yes. saying, you know what? Mr. FIFA, he gets it done. Yeah, MT for a little bit of money, but he gets it done. And the rise of the smart man, particularly in Trinidad, has been what? has caused a lot of problems in the economy. It's a little bit different in the small islands, 
But people say, you know what, if I can hustle and make a quick buck, why, why work? Why, why are you working? Why are you cutting grass? You know, I, I, I could go and you know, do this hustle over here and, and make a dollar and I'll be you know, at the bar at 11 o'clock. So I, I think the rise of the individual smart man at the level of leadership and the move towards individual gain instead of collectivist has really been what has kind of shot us in the leg in the last, I would say, particularly 30 years. So a very interesting point. Yes, you're going to get a lot of uh, you're going to get a lot of applause on that because yes, the place where you look. I, the, with the panel's permission, I'd like to maybe take. Uh, where is Nikisha? Where, oh, there you are. So I wonder if we could do a little ten minutes now and then go back and you know dig down a little more deeply, especially on migration because I think that we really have to talk about that in the context of how we can move in the Caribbean. But I know that there, there were some people who wanted to say something. So please, if you would identify yourself, and uh, maybe you'll give us your word, too, that you think of when you think of the Caribbean. Thank you very much for that, Ronald. Um, yeah. uh, there's a couple questions, so Philip, I'll let Can you Can I just uh, yeah. respond to that? Uh, just very briefly. Um, <clears throat> this is a statement um, by um, Jamaica Kincaid when she was interviewed about um, Antigua. Um, oh dear, I'll have to find it. Um, yeah. uh, yes, this is, I got it. Um, so, uh, for me, uh, she was interviewed uh, in around 2009, I don't know if those of you remember, but there was this man called Alan Sanford, who was very active <laughs> in, in the Caribbean. He ran an airline, he, ran, he started cricket, he did this and that, and he ended up in jail. <laughs> now, um, now this, and so Jamaica Kincaid was interviewed um, in, uh, soon after for The New Yorker, and this was her statement. Um, <clears throat> In Antigua, there's always a man 
a person who comes in from the rest of the world, a pirate. Piracy is very close to Antiguan history. They have been coming and hiding money and stealing for hundreds of years. This man comes to Antigua and corrupts the place and everyone's happy because they're making money. The ones who aren't benefiting from it, like me, are in the opposition. <laughs> well, yeah. Mark, mm -hmm. you want to say something else about that? No. No, okay. All right. Um, Mark, I, I, yeah, there's lots to, to answer. Do you want to make the point about why we can't take the talent, which obviously is talent, which we can't use. We already built an LNG plant here. We can't really build another one. So I don't know. We could have shares in the ones in Ghana and Nigeria. I don't know. I Mark, address how we take that talent that we have developed over 50 <coughs> years and bring it back here to solve these other problems. Well, I'll start by saying, you know, um, you know, I go to places like Singapore, and the taxi driver says, you know, you see that little spot there? Uh, that's going to have a tree on it, or that's going to have a building on it in 50 years. Uh, and I'm saying, how could a taxi driver at, you know, 60-something years old telling me about this spot for a future building or tree 50 years from now? And that means the whole population of Singapore understands where we are going. Forward movement. So to me, there is a fundamental issue to your point, Ronald, in terms of what could be different, having direction, mm -hmm. having a clear um, idea of how we capitalize all the talent, whether it's culture, whether it's energy, and how you want to how, to, how you want to harness it in a changing world, okay? Um, so one thing is policy and direction. Uh, and let's take policy, for example. I mean, we talk about the, the, the fact that we have signed on for COP21, and you know, you, you know 15% of your, 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 your renewables, has, your, your power has to be from renewables. Well, we are now in a state where our gas is being used for electricity and we don't get paid for it. <laughs> That's a state we're in. You know, you look at That's Chile. Chile in some parts are giving away electricity because they formulated an energy policy 2050. We're now in 2018. And if you go on the net, everybody can read this. They, they get it down to the whole education system where everybody understands about what energy really means and, and energy conserve, conservation and efficiency. Here we are, we fly over Trinidad and we see some nice lights, right, uh, in the stadiums and, and, and everything. It looks good. We're using gas that we don't have, right, and we're using it in electricity, which is a poor use of, of value for Trinidad and Tobago. So renewables is a big area. If you look at the whole global trends, renewable energy will not replace fossil fuels, but at least it will be a large dominant trend over the next years, as we know. Solar, wind, and so on is becoming big in that. And I must say, from the NGC standpoint, the National Energy, which is a subsidiary of NGC, is the one working right now on wind and solar and so on with the Ministry of Energy. Um, I hope we can achieve our objectives because I think we have no choice, right? Um, economically, we have no choice. But to do this, quite apart from the standards we have agreed on in, you know, by 2020, 2021 and so on. So that's one element of it, policy direction. The other thing is how do we organize ourselves exactly. in, in, in this country with limited resources and make better use of the potential we have. NGC cannot go outside of Trinidad and Tobago in Mozambique and other areas and Guyana and talk about NGC. Because in these countries, there's limited infrastructure, they need engineers, they need technicians, and you know what? We've kind of been through that and we have NESC and we have MIC and we have UTT. So 
really and truly speaking, is about organizing our resources, our institutions, so that the people who, I mean, we benefit economically from that. Exactly, like the Cubans. Um, so I, I think it needs clearer direction and needs a, it needs a better way of working, chamber to chamber, government to government arrangements. There's no way we could get through with Venezuela, for example, if there wasn't a government to government arrangement, uh, uh, heads of agreement between Shell, PDVSA, and NGC, and you work down at committee levels and you get it, things done. It, nothing would happen, right? There's a lot of work going on in that area now. That's just one example. Are we doing it in all other areas? No. No. Right? So that's, that's hopefully that answers part of the question. Um, Caroline? Hi. Um, I, I can sit, right? Do I have to stop? Okay. You can stand if you like and tell us who I can you sit. are. Oh, oh, gosh. Okay. Oh, gosh. Um, hi. <laughs> my name is. Uh, hi. My name is Caroline May. I am an environmental lawyer. I um, worked in climate change for about 10 years, working with think tanks, advising small islands in developing states at UN negotiations. Um, I just moved back to Trinidad not too long ago. So I'm very excited to hear you guys talk. And I want to talk to the two in the middle, to Sharifa and um, Alexander. Alexander. And um, because small islands, the role of small islands, as you very well know, I'm sure most people know, um, we have been the ones to actually lead us in the negotiations to where we are right now because we've spearheaded with the help of EOSIS, with the help of the EU, um, align of small, Alliance of Small Island States EOSIS, um, pushing this agenda of lowering, of, of fixing countries to lower their emissions. And, um, you know, I think that's phenomenal. We're talking about disproportionate impact that Alexander was talking about. I think that is phenomenal. That's something that we should own as a Caribbean and know about as a Caribbean. And I don't think that we actually do, um, from a layman's perspective, I should say. Um, because we are the canaries in the coal mine. We are the ones at the edge. We're the ones that are going to stand to deal with the hurricanes, the rising sea levels, the um, rising temperatures please. affecting agriculture. So I just want to hear what you guys have to say about that. It'd be very interesting. Talk um, about AOSIS. I want to I want to connect what you said to something that Mark, Mark was just saying. Mm -hmm. He was saying that we can take Trinidad and Tobago's experience in oil and gas and use that experience itself as an asset, right? And you can do that in many other things. Uh, you can do, think of it in a very positive sense. You can say, you know, if you want to host a carnival anywhere in the world, you really should be coming to a set of Trinidadian consultants, you know, and we should be exporting those skills the same way we're exporting these oil and gas skills. Now that's positive experience as an asset. Um, in her first statement, Sharifa noted something about climate change. In a strange way, if you look at it carefully, it can be an opportunity, right? We're islands. You can think of us as beakers or test tubes. If you want to create a new technology to hurricane proof or to flood proof, Really and truly, we should be saying to companies, guess what? Come here, test it out first. If you want to make an entire grid renewable, come here, test it out first. It's the ideal scale. We're facing many impacts. So, so in a strange way, we have to look at experience, the positive as an asset, but also the possibility of this whole climate change thing as, as an opportunity. And, and I think we haven't really looked at it in that regard. That? So that's my comment to that. I think in terms of the advocacy that needs to be um, had, you know, Mark's point about the taxi driver being so attuned to what's going on in the country. And I think that's very important. And, and while the UNDP has been working with government to try to get that advocacy going, I think there's a lot more that needs to be done. Uh, that should be that should be the challenge of our generation, all the 16-year-olds who are having the existentialist crises. In fact, I told them that, and soon after, a carbon neutral project started in the school, and the girls, they're all very excited. But I think that's very important to really understand what does this mean for the Caribbean? What does reducing emissions mean? How do we get into renewable energy um, you know, initiatives? And also to be able to come up with the plan of action to be able to implement some of these you know, areas. 
I recently participated in a hackathon in St. Martin, which of course, as you know, was, was hit by Irma. Um, about a billion dollars in losses. Most of their tourism is, infrastructure is gone. Um, the economy is really under severe stress and it's in a state of building back, building back better. And during that hackathon, there were about 20 groups of many young people who were looking at how do you build back better to be more resilient. And the same point you're talking about being test tubes, some of the ideas were building structures that could withstand the catastrophic hurricanes that will come again. And to be able to look at using um, geothermal energy, being able to look at waves, being able to look at different types of you know, um, sustainable energy uh, uh, solutions to be able to treat with it. And I think these are uh, some of the areas we need to look at as a region to be able to really address some of these issues. Um, but I think the biggest thing is really having that vision that has to be integrated in terms of sustainable development and to be able to ensure that we understand what does the reduction of 15% of emissions from greenhouse gases mean? Do we, look at, do we look at fuel cost pricing? You know, Mark talked about the lights in the stadium and, and, and so on. All the big tall buildings that you pass in the night looks pretty, but who's paying for that? Um, we're subsidizing a lot of our utilities. We need to start talking about that. If people don't feel, they're not going to take over the lights. So, and of course, that's a political economy argument. But I think it really comes back to us starting with that advocacy to understand climate action. What does this mean for this country? And partnering with those who are of like mind. I just want to make one comment on Ronald's point, though he said he didn't like economists. But um, <laughs> you asked oh, about how come, we, how come people are appreciated elsewhere, really, and not here. And it comes back to us valuing our own, and a word, meritocracy. We spoke about leadership. We don't understand what meritocracy is. We don't understand what it is to put the right people in the right jobs. Because of our diversity, maybe, <laughs> we, we, you know, sometimes we, you know, it's divide and rule, mm. but, but do we really have the right people in the right positions to do the strategic planning, exactly. to do the implementation, to get the job done? And that's something we need to think about. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's Sharifa's point, uh, yeah, we have, yeah, go ahead, please, please. Okay. I'm Saran Pravat, educator, and I'm going to address our sense of pride and the words we use when we speak of one another. Now, you know we're a neo-colonial space here, and we love to follow what other people do. I think if we start and think of our education here, um, we will realize that what we're doing is setting up ourselves uh, my daughter's in London, and her children go to school in their district. Straight through. In Trinidad, we have types of schools. And if you're going to that type of school, you've practically failed before you're 13 years old. That's what you think. And of course, our sense of pride, it's in our mind. It's in what we think. And if we think we're failures, it's realized. Now, I've noticed that when we go abroad and we meet other people, we, we kind of realize we're brighter than them. <laughs> when Trudy's go to London, to Toronto, to New York, and they look around, we're bright. You might have gone to junior secondary school, but when you reach there, you're bright. And we do well because at, at that point, we get a sense of pride in the Caribbean, pride in ourselves, and we go forward. But when we hear, when we hear, even when we're doing well, you think she do well? I know that girl from small, she ain't really nothing. Stops. We use the words to demean ourselves. And even when we are successful against all the odds, because as you say, our meritocracy gets timid by our tricky dadiness. There was a case where uh, a Trinidadian got a scholarship 
in um, telephone technology, came back, was passing files, nothing to do with that. During his vacation, Barbados hired him and his colleagues to organize their telephone system some good years past. Wonderful telephone system. So, and then they came back to pass files around. So we, you know, we are doing this to ourselves by not recognizing how wonderful we are, how wonderful our children are, how wonderful those who are studying are. We don't praise ourselves. I was looking even to our gold medals. We didn't praise ourselves. We look for something bad or what we thought was bad. It's our minds. It's our minds. And we push that, we push that, we pain each other. Why? So to, to change that, what we need to do is to strive to be fair in our education system, in our selection of the persons, as you were saying earlier, and in using the words to one another that would make our minds be uplifted as Trinidadians and Caribbean people. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. I see there were a couple other people. Why don't they, I'm gonna take three more and then I wanna have us, well, four, okay? One, two, three, four, right? Mm -hmm. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to identify yourself for us, oh, please. Oh, okay, sure. I'm Rhonda Garcia. I'm an administrative consultant and speculative fiction author. So um, two words that came to mind when I was sitting here was uh, transition and honestly, future. Because what I see as a problem is the basic lack of acknowledgement that we have, that we are in a period of intense global transition. And as part of that transition, everyone, including these islands, anywhere, no matter how small your society may be or how large, is questioning how, what, where, why, where are we going and why? What do we want? And the Caribbean needs to do more of that as far as I'm concerned. Initially, as we mentioned, we came through a sort of collective um, system where we sat down having been forward with, throughout whatever method, um, having thrown off the yoke of colonialism. We, in each society, came together and said, okay, what, what, what do we wanna do? We want independence. What do we wanna do? We want unions. What do we wanna do? We wanna govern ourselves. And we formed around those principles. And since then, I don't think we've really sat down and asked ourselves where we go from there. We sort of settled into this uneasy stagnation <laughs> where you both vilify and praise the thing that was above you for so long, the thing that you were shaped in, the, the society and the rules and the traditions that other people gave to us as a means of figuring out law and order. And we sat down and we accepted this and for the most part decided, okay, we're gonna do this, that, that, and that. And since then we haven't actually figured out who we are and what we want as a society and as a region. And when we made some attempt to do that, which I think for me the biggest example was the Federation, it fell apart because nobody was willing to admit that we're still holding on to what was before and we didn't really have a plan for the future. We didn't want to think about that because we were still trying to deal with the present. The reality is this, we are always in transition. We are not here to create a permanent state, a stagnation. We are literally holding things in trust for those who are already here or who are going to come after. And so I think the most important thing we need to do is stop looking at it piecemeal in terms of okay, well, we have climate issues, so we have to deal with the climate issues. We have political issues, so we have to deal with the political issues. No, it's all part of an inability or, quite frankly, a refusal to ask each one of us, ask ourselves, what do we want? As a society, I think if you ask anybody, they know what they'd like to see. Infrastructure, 
a government that is responsive to their actual needs, specific things like being able to go into a government office and get served immediately, being able to sign up for electricity and get connected within the week, being able to go to your political representative and actually talk to your political representative in his actual space, and then have him go to parliament and talk about what it is his people his, in his area spoke to him about rather than something that he thinks will get him back in power in four years. And I think that if we are going to look at future, and we have to recognize that the best way to do that is to allow these same young people who are going to be stuck with whatever we do now to actually create influence and think about what they want. Because we, caught in transition, are afraid of the transition, are afraid of change. Transition makes people fearful. And we cling to things we know or think we know or think we understand in the wake of that. When Thank the you. truth is what we need to do is let go of that, think about what's important to us as a society, think about what we need that isn't here, think about why we don't feel proud when we look around, and then do the thing that will make us proud, do the thing that will make us feel that we've achieved that future that we're supposed to be holding in trust. Thank you very much. I think both of you all just spoke to something that um, mm -hmm. we, we generally avoid in the Caribbean and, and um, we no longer teach, which is what is our underlying philosophy? Why, why, why do we not discuss you know, philosophy with, with our children? What is our underlying Caribbean philosophy? And it's a very important question that people are not asking or exploring anymore. Yep. I, I'm going to take this person, and there was, yeah, one person here, yeah. And then we're going to talk a little bit more up here. I just wanted, my name is Annalie Davis. I'm a visual artist based in Barbados. I wanted to build on Alexander's statement about the rise of the individual smart man. At the level of leadership, the prime minister of my country and the opposition are advocating for people to buy and sell votes in our upcoming election. So there is a real crisis of leadership in the Caribbean, and I don't think we can depend on the state to bail us out of the situation that we're currently in. Um, given that this is a panel about island futures, I wanted to know if, and I think Alexander is the only person on the panel that's working with a Caribbean association, where do you see hope? Because Irma and Maria solidified in a moment of crisis that we have to function as a Caribbean space. Where is the hope across the region where we're working in an intra-Caribbean way that reaffirms the of being Caribbean people? Where is the hope for the future of these islands? Where is that being manifested right now in policy? Where is it actively happening to shape a future collectively? We cannot do this as island nations. Let me get that one last question. Okay, a great question, Annalise. That the, the gentleman right there, and then we're going to let the panel respond. Okay. Good morning. My name is Jalaluddin Khan. Uh, my background is in environmental management and planning, and I'm also a reader. The first, a comment and a question. Will be very brief. One in terms of the comment about the Caribbean space. I just want to remind both the audience and also our panelists in our statements being made that. We are living in a new Caribbean. There's an older civilization of the Caribbean that we have to remember. And we hear about immigrants coming in, but we met a space with peoples here, our indigenous peoples, the cultures, technologies, etc. So please recognize and, and infuse that in your thinking and thought. The second is a comment, um, and also a question to raise about victimhood. Overall, we're hearing about dysfunctions and, and dysfunction in governance or administrations and how to move forward in terms of strategic ways moving forward. I'd like to throw towards the panel about design thinking, about management thinking, about ownership of, of self-governance. Because what's important, and through being a literary festival, all of our artists speak about it, in terms of taking control or uh, responsibility for oneself, as an individual, a political system, and also leadership. So the whole question of vision and development planning, et cetera, I want to throw it back about how the education system functions and how the education functions in power ourselves and also the politics of power in the Caribbean is used to either not develop or to control a few while a uh, minority control a few while the majority is, con is not moving forward. Thank you. Well, I, as you can see, we have a very good audience. Many of them should be up here on the panel. They're quite provocative um, questions.
questions, and I would like for the panel to try to focus in on the education that would allow people to be agents for their own future, and then pick up on whether that can give us hope, because the, I think that's the question that they're asking of us, and you know, is, is this a hopeful time? Can we make it more hopeful? Um. Well, first, Annalie, you put me on the spot because I am here as Alexander Gervon, environmental economist, not Alexander Gervon, on, program ACS. coordinator of yes. the Caribbean Sea. So, you know, no invitation <laughs> was sent to the ACS, and if my boss sees this, I may be in trouble. But <laughs> um, there, there, there is a lot of hope out there. Um, the question was asked before about um, the people that can, sorry, the people that could come back. Um, and, and young people, and I definitely see amongst my generation a uh, hunger awakening in first, second, you know, third generation, you know, children of Caribbean peoples in the diaspora. And um, I see them coming back, especially when it comes to creative industries. So I think, you know, in the next, you know, five to ten years, there's going to be a benefit to be reaped of those people coming back. So there's definitely a lot of hope there. Um, on environmental issues, you know, uh, the problems are shared. Climate change problems are basically the same across all the islands. And within our cohort of environmental diplomats, you actually see us working pretty well. You know, the 1.5 to stay alive thing, everybody knew about that. And um, that was pushed by SIDS globally, but it was really the Caribbean SIDS that had a huge, huge hand in that. And Caroline can probably speak to that very, very well. So there is some, some hope there. Um, this event, this platform, gives me a lot of hope. <laughs> when I see how Bocas has transformed, you know, the amount of people that fly in for this festival, you know, the, the, um, it recently won an award for, from, from Penguin, I think, to, you know, one of the, the most top 20 literary festivals in the world. You know, these events certainly give me hope. So I think there's a, there's a lot of um, hope to be had and, um, we have to be optimistic. Because if you're not optimistic, you, you exclude a lot of possibilities that are just outside your reach, but it can be made possible. So there's a lot of, of hope to be had. I'm sorry, I didn't follow the moderator's instructions. I just answered <laughs> no, your question. No, that's, that's good, that's good. Mark, uh, we'll yeah. work our way down. Yeah, I guess I want to speak to the topic of identity, which I started off talking, and I think it was raised couple times here, and um, uh, the question was how do we design our way uh, out of it. Uh, one thing is the education system, the other thing is what can, what can companies do? Because there's not everything happening in the education system. And you know, the, the NGC uh, has tried to connect dots here. Uh, and I think it's some of the, the sports people coming out of the I guess the good work of Miles in the back there, hiding quite uh, quietly. I mean, he's the one, you know, like leading the right on track, and AAA programs and so on. And out of which you get these kind of, you know, world-class athletes. Um, and then you, you, you have this nourishment going on at the, you know, Bocas Lit and Sandfest and so on. And you, and you get these, all these writers coming out on the, on the world stage. So some of it, doesn't have to be all in the education system. Sure. Some of it could be how we, how we actually focus and get the talent that I started off with harnessed. Uh, I, I just want to delve a little bit on the, on the, on the pan wool a little bit, um, given my strong uh, addiction to that area. <laughs> <clears throat> but but in, in the pan wool, here we are, having invented a, you know, this instrument here in, in Trinidad and Tobago. But at the same time, the tuners are going away. Mm -hmm. uh, Ellie Manet, or you know, one of the father of the instrument here, is is in West Virginia teaching tuners in the states. Um, and pretty soon, the whole world of tuning is going to change globally, right? So unless we have the institutions that really say, you know, this is an important local expertise for the instrument design right here. And we are learning and writing and forging patents and, you know, have you seen a patent that is, uh, you know, papers written 
uh, on this topic uh, coming from Trinidad and Tobago, not very often. There's from Germany, there's from the States and so on. So our own instrument is, you know, having dissertations and, uh, and things all over the world, but we, we lack it. Uh, and, and it gets back to the point being made that unless we recognize our own um, Worth. value, Worth. Yes. identity, uh, unless you learn these things in school, I mean, why is it that we have so many of our so-called icons in society, I mean, really uh, sometimes feeling ignored? Uh, and they're not utilized in the same education system where we should be learning about what they went through because soon enough they're not going to be around. Um, and, and where is the website or museum that really tells the whole story <laughs> about our evolution and, and so on and so on and coming, so on. Coming, um, coming. So this gets to the heart of the, the issue. What are we valuing here? And, and I'm uh, moving away from energy deliberately and I'm going straight to the, culture. the, the, the culture of our country. And, and here we are, you know, where it's appreciated so much outside. Uh, and when you look deep down under the surface in Trinidad, I mean, what can we point to, right? Yeah. Uh, where, where's the education on, on these wild our tuners disappear and so on? So it's happening. I'm not saying there's not work in this area. There is there's work, some work going on in MIC and various areas. But to me, after, I guess, some decades, I would have liked to see uh, a, a, a dedicated, institution teaching acoustics, material sciences, innovations, and all of these things, which I don't see. Um, and I, I see a, a lot more happening outside of Trinidad and Tobago, unfortunately. So that is I did, that's an that's example an of, of kind of like bringing this topic um, to the real one. Yep, island states of mind. We've exported something, and people have loved it, and they have taken it and developed it in a way that we have not. I, I was just, you know, we really pained to hear so the, you know, the, pre the question from the back, I think the educator and, and then the lady behind, in terms of the structures that we continue to perpetuate, that constrain us, and do we need some disruption? Maybe that's not a word I should be using, but disruption technology, you know, disruptive technology. Do we need some disruption to really change that? Or are we continuing with the same analysis paralysis, with the same structures that we meet, you know, as a Caribbean community, and, and we tick boxes, and we have decisions that take forever to be implemented. Somebody was telling us yesterday, I think, about we were meeting with, with doctors and trying to look at procurement reform. And they were saying, yes, we're evaluating this for 15 years now. And, and the machine only lasts for five years. And there is no maintenance plan. So we have an office of procurement regulator. And then what? You know. So I think it's really about thinking deeply about these structures and the way that these structures really constrain us rather than unleash our potential. The educators well spoke about young people and the scholars who we, we bring them back because we have them sign a contract. And yet what do they do? Nothing. We have them photocopying documents. We have brilliant young people coming back with, you know, we've invested millions of dollars, open scholarships, and yet they can't find jobs. And if they do find a job, because we have to catch them quickly, right, the hustlers, we have to just give them something. There is no mentorship, there is no guidance, there's frustration in these young people. The cement, we, 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 so whilst this is all hopeful, and Vicky had a conference recently, or an engagement rather, it was on a conference, she's not into rigid structures, and that's what I like about her, where we had civil society and private sector coming together. Brilliant ideas. One of the ideas is actually that cultural center. On a weekend, what do we do? Go to movie town with our children. Go to, what else is there to do? For those of us who have lived abroad, there are so many opportunities, so many things. 
We, do we have a space where we can go and look at the pan, where we can teach, you know, we have the tourists go and, and, and learn to play. We've been talking about these things, but nothing is happening. So where, so whilst this is great, we have the ideas and so on, and the talk shops, when are we going to close that implementation deficit? How are we going to glue all that is going on together from the academics, from the private sector, the education sector, we need to have, and we have the vision, but do we know anything about the visions in our own countries? And I don't want to be territorial and just talk about Trent Tobago, right? We hear visions and we just use them in a speech. So yes, we have a vision, there's a document here. But are we really living that vision? Do we know that vision like the, the, the taxi driver? Who is going to bring all of it together for us to move forward? Otherwise, I'm sorry, we're going to be going around in circles. But I'm an eternal optimist, so I really would like us to, out of this, to challenge all of us, to let us come up with some kind of structure, because we can't keep with a victimhood and blaming the politicians, and they have a lot to be blamed for, or, or, or diversity, or, or other, you know, or, or look for other persons and, and structures to blame. And we need to find ways to fix this and to fix it now. Our very survival depends on that. Can I just um, add a, a brief sort of comment, really? Which is that it strikes me that uh, I'm a very sort, sort of old-fashioned regionalist. Um, and it, in the sense that it seems to me that one of the obstacles that we face is to do with um, an extreme sense of island sovereignty. Uh, and until we find a way to get around that, we, we are constantly coming up against um, th this, this problem. Um, that the regional element just does not really get enough of a look in. And um, that gets in the way of so many things um, that, that I, 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 and it, it is, it is, I, for me it's essential for, for the region actually to develop. Um, then the other aspect is, uh, to, to take it back to the smallest scale, is to do with, imagi is to do with imagination in education. And I find that um, so much of it is extreme, still extremely rote oriented. And until we get over that rote situation, I can't really see the, I mean there's scope of course for imagination, but, but it, has to be, um, it has to be developed and, and it can be taught. Um, there are people who can teach or encourage people to use their imagination. And I think that's absolutely essential. Uh, and then problems can get solved. But for me, those two areas, bo areas, both in terms of the overall structure and in terms of that immediate education issue, um, uh, are things that need fixing. Well, I I, I'd like to bring us a tiny, tiny thing. I just wanted to add to the hope in regionalism, um, <laughs> ma ma mainly because um, one of one of my bosses here is here, the Cuban ambassador, <laughs> um, and I wanted to just make a shameless plug for a mu movie they're hosting called Gauma, Entre el Mar y la Montaña, Guma, Guma between the sea and the mountain. And there's really a lot of possibility for us in terms of learning from each other, particularly from countries like Cuba. So I just wanted to make a shameless plug there. That's not a shameless plug. It's a, it's a uplifting plug. Why don't you give us a little bit more it's information? In it's in the program, so you're gonna be able to find it. I, you know, we have 15 minutes left, and I really wanna pick up on the comments that came from the audience, especially about the idea of design thinking. Because what I've heard from the panel is this amorphous we, and I don't know who those Caribbean regional leaders are that would allow us to be like the man in the taxi in Singapore who have articulated a vision for where we should be thinking as a region. And I think that the young woman who spoke about transition, I, I think this point is very important. It's one that I've often made. We live in a world of change. We heard that change is the only constant. So if we are building structures or if we are trying to figure out pathways that deal with something which is like the Caribbean Sea, it, it, we have to deal with the structures in the same way we deal with a boat, their waves, their currents, there are things that are changing, but we tend to build for solid land. 
and that's not what we're on and therefore we always get stymied when it breaks down. I, I just want to throw that out and um, do you know it's my prerogative as chair to tell you the little story of the little girl who came to the green market and she was in the bunny hop with a parent or grandparent and she didn't understand an instruction and the person called her stupid a set of other names and the child was so flustered and I myself intervened and said please don't ever call her that again but but she didn't I said don't ever call her that. So you have to understand where we are in terms of not school, but home and parents and other people because the denigration is pretty constant. The denigration is pretty constant. So here we are, island states of mind, surrounded by water, filled with talent, having a disproportionate impact on the rest of the world through our diaspora, filled with limitless possibilities, having an amazing ability to hustle. There was, a, there was a song called Do the Hustle. I remember that song. It was a really nice song. It had a little ting, ting, ting. <laughs> I can't sing, but it was not so much of a negative. It was an ability to shift. It was an ability to move. It was an ability to be resilient. But once again, we internalize the message on the negative side as opposed to maybe the positive side. I'd like to, are there any burning comments, questions from, uh, from out in our expert audience? Good. Magic, go right ahead. OK, we have 10 minutes. Um, I have, is there a mic for this young lady? Good, it's coming. Um, well, good morning everyone. My name is Rayanne Paris. I am a Boca Slit Fest youth blogger as well as a UE student. So listening to the panel today was really enlightening. But I also have some comments as well as questions that I would like to direct to the panelists. I was wondering, being a double major in bio and chemistry, to Mr. Mark, um, about using our garbage, because I know we generate a lot of waste in Trinidad and Tobago. So I wanted to know what is the possibility of using this waste to generate elect um, energy, uh -huh. I mean, in terms of electricity as well, because it can be done as well as um, exporting our garbage. Because I know, um, I think it is Switzerland or the one of these of countries in the China. UK, they export their garbage <laughs> to help their recycle plants to keep mm -hmm. running because they have one of the lowest um, China garbage accepting. rates in the world. I think it's below 1% of their households actually produce garbage. So they want to know so I'd like to know what is the possibility of us, you know, exporting our waste to them to help them run their recycling plants because mm -hmm. it can come at a cost which will generate our revenue, yeah? So oh, that's one question. And the second question, no, not the second question, the second point that I'd like to make is in terms of successive planning. In Trinidad, we have that issue in that most of the institutions that we go to, it's more of a drop drop us here and we learn to swim and then eventually when we learn to swim we learn how to do our jobs properly and then that's it. There is no real transitioning period as one of our commentators made in the back. It's more of, I'd say being a survivor of the education system, I can really see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get back to that, why I say that. You may that. not have survived yet. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I say this because Having been exposed to different internships, I mean, you're an intern, you do the small stuff, but no one really teaches you how to do the big stuff. How do you learn to lead? How do you learn to become a minister? How do you learn to be an ambassador? How do you learn to be the president of a company? How do you learn these things if they're not taught, yeah? There are no programs, there aren't any programs that actually help you transition into these periods. They send you on training workshops, as I understand, because I'm not formally employed, mm -hmm. but they send you on training workshops workshops and then I you think. come back with all the head knowledge, but what about the practical skill? 
Yeah. That's a very good question. And then um, in terms okay, of... Okay, you're going to get just a little bit more time because I do have to wrap it up. Oh, so I okay. wanted your question to come in beforehand. Before, okay. Okay, well, so... Right. I'll stop there then. You'll stop there? Yeah. Okay, you can't make it, you can make it short oh. if it's just a question so they can answer. Okay, um, just two more points in terms of the cultural centers and the ministry and um, our president's, well, former president's suggestion of having a ministry of science, technology, and innovation. I think that's something that we can push for in the future. Thank you very much. Okay. Leadership, I think, uh, you know, out of all the things that this young student said, I mean, how do we learn to lead? How do we help our leaders lead? And let's uh, have your closing thoughts on this island state of mind. I think it's, uh, those are excellent points raised. Uh, leadership is always one of the the intangible issues that, you know, you, you don't get taught in school. And, and the thing about it is, as, as I've joined and worked in several companies all over the world, whether it's in France or Italy or Germany or wherever, the issue that we're always dealing with is one of getting the right leaders in the right positions, right? And there's always a, if there's one niche of business that is going on in Trinidad and anywhere in the world is leadership development, right? So no one teaches you how you forge direction, or, and far less what direction to forge. Um, and leadership starts with knowing where you want to go. Um, and a big part of leadership is how to get everyone there. Um, and, and no one teaches you that. So how, how, how do you get somewhere, everyone it, with some direction in your mind, you know? A NGC was always a company that, you know, um, had very long contracts, 20 years, you know, relatively cheap pricing. Um, and that world has changed now. It's still upside down. There are short contracts, there are high pricing, and we're now negotiating all the contracts in the industry. Um, and therefore, the whole ability of resources, institutional capacity, I mean, that is now, I mean, we've never had to do this before. So all of a sudden, we are faced with um, having to hire people, train people. And that's a challenge that I see. I, I go to many meetings. Um, and here it is that all the meetings have retirees. Yep. You know, where, where are the? Young we are the young people that uh, you know that somebody well, spoke about all the scholarship people that, that, that we have um, so I think the importance of knowing direction and how you want to get there and what resources you need to get there is always a question that is relevant for governments for companies for uh, individual firms and everything else um, and that, that is a continued challenge for for us but it all starts with knowing where you want to go I, we have five minutes, so I'm going to be very yeah. brief and speak to the leadership issue as well. Um, a big problem that we face in the Caribbean is that we rely on individuals, we rely on individual personalities. So when you see the departure of a leader in a big organization, the entire thing is topsy-turvy. Well, why is that? And, and why are leaders not rising, the young people not rising? It has a lot to do with our frameworks and processes. We don't necessarily in our culture rely on framework and processes as much. If you go to the Germanys, if you go to these other places, there are systems in place. So you may come with your own individual style, but you're still operating within a system and you're still being groomed within that framework. And here we rely too much on individual personality and I think that that is a, a weakness of a lot of our, our systems. Um, just to tie up, this is the last time I'm gonna speak because we have five more minutes. I, I would really like to congratulate the festival. It really does give me a lot of hope. Um, and as well, you know, you Mark for having the vision to, to, to sponsor something like this. Um, to you and the other sponsors, I think, really you know a lot of respect and it really does give me a lot of hope that we're able to have these discussions with you know a chairman of a, of a ngc you know it, it's it's really quite fascinating and it does give me some hope so thank you all very much Sharifa. Yes. i'm sorry we did not have time to really get into the design thinking and how we change the way we think and educate our children and i think one of the major things we need to really look at uh, as a country is the way we do the rote teaching, the SEA exams and whatever it's, you know, um, nomenclatures across the Caribbean. 
And perhaps lead a charge to stop that. It robs children of their childhood, and it robs children of thinking capacity. And I think we need to start by doing some of these things. Um, the succession planning will come along. Life skills is something we don't teach. We haven't really spoken about the family and the role of parents, the role of communities, the role of our villages raising children. And I life skills. Yes. Oh. Again, and the flip-flopping of policy. So I think those are things that are very critical in terms of how we teach civics was something that was taught in the past. And how do we really bring these values, because we can have the materialistic you know, gains and so on. But if we don't have our basic values as a society, this morning I was listening to Goldily Bruce. There's something circulating on social media speech. And she was talking about things like gratitude, being humble, sincerity. And these are values that we don't really learn in school. And we learn these, these things probably in our homes, in kindergarten, in our communities. So how do we get back those values? Thank you. Uh, Philip. So I can go back to um, Derek Walcott again. Walcott said that um, uh, Caribbean society is a performance society. People stand up, and what we do is we show. We do a lot of performing. <laughs> and I, and uh, I think that there becomes a problem with that, because if the focus then is on you all the time, one of the issues about leadership is when do you decide to give somebody else a chance? Mm -hmm. Very good point. So I would like for all of those in the audience to put their hands together and to thank our panelists. Uh, I think it's been a very rich discussion. Lots of applause. The panelists, you can applaud the audience, too. I'd like to thank Danica for starting us off with the notion of magic, because I think that a lot of the leadership, there is a little bit of magic to leadership and how you get people to follow along with you and think it's their own idea because that's really what it's about. We have to make people think it's their own idea so they own it and move forward. And as, Mar as everyone has said, we'd like to thank Marina for being persistent. It's a really brilliant book. It's a really, it's very short too, but it's really brilliant. <laughs> oh, this is your copy.